It is said that organisms can manifest intelligence when they come together and act in concert. And these are some of the kind of bacteria that you find in the gut. They're coliform bacteria, like E. coli. And they will sometimes join together to form a, uh, a sort of embroidery pattern of millions of cells. And it is said that when these communities of cells act together, they're better at generating uh, agents that can destroy antibiotics and becoming antibiotic resistant than they would have done if they're acting on their own. And so the model has come about that cells in consort can, in some strange way, manifest the rudiments of intelligence. I'm going to argue something totally different tonight. And that is that the intelligence is inherent in each single cell and not in the group. Because here's another amoeba. Diflugia. This is a, a drawing I made a third of a century ago. And it shows an amoeba which lives inside a shell. A shell it constructs for itself. This amoeba crawls around on the surface of the mud at the bottom of its pond. It finds little tiny grains of silicious sand which it picks up. We don't know how it finds them. We've never looked to see how it identifies them. We have no idea how it picks them up. It then sticks them together with what we do not know and how we cannot imagine to produce this wonderful vase-like house for itself. Now, as kids, we marveled at cad caddisflies and how they built a little shelter for themselves. And yet a caddisfly uses any old gunge lying around at the bottom of the pond. Bits of roots, bits of stems, bits of leaves, anything. The amoeba is far more discriminating. And let's face it, the caddisfly larva has jaws and eyes and muscles and nerves. It's got claws and limbs and appendages. The amoeba, as we were told in school, is the simplest and most lowly form of animal life. It hasn't got any of those things. And yet it builds a home for itself. Here's a photograph taken by Bill Cantonland of another shell of an amoeba built by discarded built from discarded diatom frustules, diatoms, little round diatom shells, which this creature has picked up and glued together. Under the electron microscope, you can see some, like this example, seem to have secreted scales uh, uh, out of which it's built its, its shell. Others, and this is an example of diflugia, pick up the sand grains and glue them together. But here I'm making a mistake. Here we're looking, as I'm always saying, we shouldn't just look, and the electron microscope, these are the dead, charred, inert remains. What we need to do is to go and look at them under the microscope, as they really look, under a light microscope. These are radiolarians. They're the skeletons of radiolarians. They're amongst the most abundant microfossils, and they produce within themselves these glassy, perforated shells. They secrete these within themselves. And so, of course, that could easily be modelled as a simple process of secretion in which the, the design of the shell is simply directly related to the number of pores in the cytoplasm or whatever else it might be. But now I want to, to move on because we will look at some of the cells that produce for themselves Nabila collaris. Collaris because it produces a collar. You can see the collar at the bottom end of the cell. It's an extraordinarily beautiful structure. Looked at from an oblique angle, and you can see that it's a flattened flask. And look at the beautiful column it constructs for itself, so that it will have a, a soft and rounded opening out of which it can emerge to perform its daily tasks. Here are the sand grains that are stuck together by diflugia. This is a diflugia shell. They're quite common in the water that you squeeze from moss. Not rare to find, you just have to be diligent and look around to search them out. And here is another diflugia. I focused high here so that you can see the way in which the sand grains are meticulously stuck together, like a dry stone wall or crazy paving. If you have ever made a dry stone wall or laid crazy paving, your relatives or your neighbours were impressed. They will think you were pretty darned clever to do that with your brain and your limbs and your cement mixer. But the, ce the, the cement that has glued this together is made by the amoeba. Where is its template? Where are its limbs? What is its holding facility? Nobody has ever known. 
If you look closely, you can see this is the, the, the apical point at the top end of the Diffluidia shell. You see, you could always try and simplify this, as people love to do with microbes. They love to see microbes as ineffably simple and as much too elementary to be worth bothering with. So you could model the way in which amoebae make these shells by saying, well, perhaps the amoeba gets sticky and rolls around in the sand. It doesn't work. Because you can identify the species by the exact shape of the cell. And this particular diffluger always makes a little point at the far end of its shell and sticks together the sand grains with great meticulousness. On the right-hand side there, you will notice that the sand grains are smallest and most rounded around the opening through which it has to hang. So this little amoeba is able to make a comfortable opening for itself, just as Nabila collaris did. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Some of these um, algae live in rather large, uh, almost blobby cell constructions. They, they produce vesicular sac. And you can see there are large groups of algae living inside a very delicate sac. This thing is almost like a, um, a balloon. Clearly, it could be very easily punctured. The easiest thing in the world to puncture a balloon like that, ladies and gentlemen. And so these, as you can imagine, have evolved specially uh, developed techniques to recover from damage. If they do get punctured, they're able, in some way that we do not understand, to mend the puncture and then, with perfect precision, to reinflate the cell back to its original quantum. Now, this is getting into us in interesting territory because we now encounter a third component of my argument about living cells. We've seen how they discriminate, we've seen how they can act on their own, and now we're beginning to watch for signs of frank ingenuity. An amoeba that builds a shell for itself must inevitably have some sort of ingenuity in its makeup, since no two sand grains are ever going to be the same. No two environments are ever going to be the same. And yet the shell that it makes has always to look the same. And so these creatures are beginning to show some sort of frank ingenuity. Now then, let's watch this one that has been experimentally punctured. It's speeded up 15 times faster than life. And you can see that the cytoplasm is pumped back in from the parent plant body. The pressure increases until eventually it's almost inflated and suddenly with an almost audible popping sound its original contour is entirely restored. Now, yes, 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 that could be pure mechanics. But you still have to accept that the cell, in some strange way, knew how to repair the damage, and also that it knew how to inflate itself to the right extent, and not to go too far. Now, these were also drawn by Leeuwenhoek back in the 1670s. <coughs> these are coccoliths filmed by Jeremy. And coccoliths are interesting shells because they're algae, they're widespread fossils, and each cell is covered with scales, like this one, under the electron microscope. The scales can be little or big, as in this case. Beautiful scales. And if you take a section of the cell, you can see where, the top right hand there, you can see where these scales are being synthesized and manufactured inside the cell. And here is one of the coccoliths under high power. And you can see that the, the little scales have been manufactured, have been synthesized, assembled inside the cell, and they're being pumped out, aren't they, through a little pore on the bottom left-hand corner. Pumped out so that they can then take their place on the surface of the cell, where they act like some kind of scaly protection from predators. But watch this one, because it produces a scale. Watch where the arrow is. Did you see that turnover? We're going to see it again in a moment. It produces a scale that it senses, we don't know how, is the wrong way up. So this cell, we have no idea what the mechanism might be. This cell actually manages to flip the scale over before it puts it in position. Now watch where the arrow is, and that little scale there. 
just flips over. This tiny, so-called primitive algal cell has enough ingenuity not only to produce these enormously elaborate scales and pump them outside through its little pore and arrange them around the surface of its body, but if one comes up the wrong way up, it can flip it over. Nobody has any idea how. And when you read books about amoebae and coccolis, they will say that most amoebae are um, single cells, they're naked cells, they crawl around the mud. And then they'll come to the bit about the testate amoebae, the ones that make shells. And they will say, this is a group of amoebae that create shells by cementing together sand grains. And with that, they move on. Nobody says, how on earth can something so primitive make something so beautiful? And in the diminutive sense, However, can a coccolith sense that its scale is the wrong way up and turn it over before it puts it in position? Not only has no one the answer to the question, ladies and gentlemen, nobody else ever seems to have asked the question. In the sequence I'm going to show you lies the seat of my concept that we can prove cells have intelligence. In front of you is a still from a video of a group of red algal cells under the microscope. And there's a big cell right across the middle. And what Jeremy has done is to pick up a steel needle. And with the steel needle, he cuts right across the cell and breaks it in half. As you can see, the cell in the middle has emptied. It's dead. All the cytoplasm is dissolved out into the water surrounding. You're left with a cellulose cell wall which is as broken and as empty as if you'd cracked an egg to make an omelet. And if you had cracked the egg and the eggshells were now broken completely in half, as those cell walls are, and the eggshell was completely empty, you would never expect the shell to be mended and the egg to be refilled. But now I'm going to show you the video of what this primitive red alga called antithamnion actually does. There is the broken cell. You can see, this is speeded up 25 times. There is the broken cell, and you can see it looks irretrievably broken. But as we watch, the cells alongside, in some way that we have no idea how they do this, detect the damage. And so they creep in and begin to fill up the empty space until it's completely filled. And if you watch, they begin to realign the cell wall so that if we look at it under high power, you can see the broken cell wall. They're right in the middle of the picture. And if you watch very closely, you can see how the two ends become aligned and their new cell wall material is very gently produced until it fills in the space between the two and you end up with an invisibly mended cell. So I'll show you that again. There is a cell broken with Jeremy's steel needle, irrevocably damaged, dead and empty. And the cells alongside detect what has gone on. The cytoplasmic contents increase in size and migrate into the damaged cell walls. And then, before your astonished eyes and under high power, we can see what happens. As the cell wall contents is reinstated, the broken cell walls are, bro are brought together. New cell wall material appears between the two of them and you end up with the cell walls almost invisibly mended and a fully functioning cell where there was nothing but death before. Now that is to me the most crucial component of my argument to you this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Depends what you mean by intelligence. And there are a great many definitions. And they argue at enormous length about many different facets of human ability. But if you go back to 1905, you find it defined as the ability to understand or deal with new or trying situations. That's what we've just seen. Because if you think about it, a cell filament like that could never be broken in nature under those circumstances.